Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Addiction Recovery Channel. I'm Ed Baker, and I'm your host. Thank you for sharing your time with us today. Today, as our guest, we have Dr. Joseph Durazio. Dr. Durazio is an emergency physician, medical toxicologist, and addiction medicine specialist at the Lewis Katz School of Medicine at Temple University. He cares for Temple patients in a variety of settings, including the emergency department, an inpatient consultative service for addiction medicine and toxicology, the trust clinic, an office-based opioid treatment program, and Begin the Turn, Temple's Low Barrier Access Streetside Medi Medicine Program. Dr. Durazio is a medical toxicologist for the Poison Control Center at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and is regarded as a regional expert regarding substance use and substance use disorder treatment in Philadelphia. Thank you, doctor, for being on the show. Thanks for having me. You know, I'd just like to set the stage by giving you some uh, information about what's happening in Vermont. In Vermont, since 2010, we've seen a quintupling of polydrug overdose death. 2022 was the worst year ever. It seems like every year is the worst year ever. In 2022, we had confirmed 237 accidental polydrug overdose deaths with 24 pending, so potentially 261 deaths in one year. That's one every 33 hours in this little state. 93% of those deaths involved fentanyl, and just under 30% involved xylazine. And, um, you know, you've done a lot of research on this. Uh, you've got boots on the ground on this in, in Philadelphia. And I would just like, I'd like to hear from you to begin with, and then we can zero in on stuff, but to begin with, what is your assessment about what's happening in our country with the unregulated drug supply? Well, I think sort of um, sort of echo exactly what you said there, Ed. I, you know, I think the major drug that we're dealing with is fentanyl as uh, the cause of death of, of overdose. Um, you know, here in Philadelphia, we're seeing the same sort of the same sort of things. Uh, the numbers are sort of on a higher scale, but you know, we're sort of a bigger big city. Um, but we're seeing the same same uh, effects. Fentanyl is the major drug. You know, more than 90% of overdose deaths are caused by fentanyl here, and you know, more than 30% of those uh, opioid overdose deaths uh, are, are they are test positive for xylazine and post mortem, so they're being exposed to xylazine also. For the viewing, now my viewing audience is varied. There's some, you know, practitioners, some recovery coaches, some people who are using drugs, families, harm reductionists. You know, can you can you explain to us, you know, what what is what is xylazine? Why why is it being mixed with fentanyl? What what is going on? So xylazine is a sedative. It's a veterinary sedative. So it's typically used to uh, sedate animals to do a procedure. Um, you know, if, if uh, like uh, you need a surgical procedure done on a horse, a cat, a dog, um, they will get xylazine and uh, it puts them to sleep so they can perform that procedure. Um, it has now made it made its way outside the veterinary supply uh, or the veterinary supply has made it outside of the veterinary world and uh, is on the streets and so we first started seeing xylazine in puerto rico in the early 2000s mm -hmm. and uh, the first hint of it being uh, here in the mainland was in philadelphia in 2006 and then we saw a rapid increase in 2018 with xylazine and so uh, why it's in there, I think, is a really good question, and I don't think we necessarily have that answer. I think there's a lot of conjecture about what the reasons it could be in there. You know, the word on the street is that it gives fentanyl legs, and that's the, that's the phrase that I hear all the time, you know, that, like, uh, fentanyl is a really short-acting opioid, and uh, xylazine can, uh, can provide, like, a longer period of sedation. Um, associated with fentanyl use, and so there's not nearly as much up and down 
Um, I'm not quite sure that's necessarily uh, true, uh, you know, and, I, and I'm not quite sure that's the reason why xylosine is in the supply, but it certainly causes a sedative effect. Dr. Uh, Richard Rawson, who is a researcher here in um, Vermont with uh, the University of Vermont, has been active in this field for a long time in addictions, and um, he he was wondering, he it, he's hearing from 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 people who use drugs that one of the things that's occurring is because xylazine has a relatively long half life, and fentanyl has a relatively short half life, some users are experiencing the sedation of xylazine longer than the drug effect of fentanyl, and they're coming, they're, they're coming out of the xylazine sedation in withdrawal from fentanyl. Have you heard? Is that true? Have you heard anything like that? Yeah, you know, I, I hear about this a lot um, from, my, from my, my patients that I'm taking care of. They'll say, you know, I used a bag and it was heavy on trank, meaning xylazine, and I woke up three or four hours later, I felt like I got no opioid effect out of it, and then I was in withdrawal when I came to. And certainly that goes to that, that sort of the pharmacokinetics certainly work there. The duration of effect of xylazine is going to be much longer than fentanyl. Uh, it really depends on the dose at which you're getting, though, too, but mm -hmm. uh, certainly we can see a scenario in which the xylazine is going to outlast the fentanyl effect duration of effect, and then people, you know, the opioid portion has worn off and you're just to date from the xylazine. So, so now we're seeing people with, 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 with fentanyl addiction, and we're seeing people with xylazine addiction running concurrently. Is that what's happening? <clears throat> well, you know, we're not really seeing anyone that's necessarily using xylazine alone. Um, and actually, when I talk to people who are using they typically say they're trying to avoid xylazine, like they, they wish it wasn't in the supply. Uh, and they really want the opioid effect, not the sedative effect. Um, so we're not necessarily treating anyone for uh, addiction to xylazine. You know, certainly uh, we have noticed a lot of uh, talk about xylazine dependence. And when you're not, people are not using xylazine, they're getting sick. Um, but I, not, to my knowledge, I'm not quite sure we're, there's a lot of treatment going on for like a, an addiction to xylazine, as in like people having difficulty putting it down. You know, I, I think I used the wrong, the incorrect terminology. What, so we have fentanyl addiction but, and xylazine dependence. Do we see mm -hmm. withdrawal from xylazine? That's a good question because uh, certainly people who are using xylazine will describe that. Um, you know, it's my withdrawals is not the same anymore. You know, I used to be able to just like a couple of days if I were to stop and go through opioid withdrawal, but now I'm having anxiety and restlessness that lasts much longer or that, you know, ever since xylazine made it into our supply, my withdrawal just felt different. But you know, the symptoms typically of xylazine withdrawal are like anxiety, dysphoria, restlessness. And, uh, as you can see, that that's an over; those are overlapping symptoms with sure. opioid withdrawal, and so sometimes it's really hard to differentiate the two. Is this just really bad opioid withdrawal, or is there really such thing as xylazine withdrawal? You know, you certainly can't find it in a textbook. There has not really been much research into this, um, at least not that I know of. And certainly, we need to start looking into uh, the dependence to xylazine. But what we have seen is an ever-increasing dose of fentanyl in the community. And so while maybe a couple years ago, we were talking about like a milligram of fentanyl, then it went to two milligrams of fentanyl per bag. And now we're dealing with five milligrams of fentanyl per bag um, in Philadelphia. And so, you know, some part of me thinks that there is xylazine withdrawal. There really is a dependence. But another part of me thinks that it really just could be due to the you know, the ever rising dose of opioid. Yeah, you know, well, I, w I visited uh, Kensington in February and, um, you know, it's interesting that you say pe my people not, would be trying to avoid xylazine, but I was told that people are also trying to avoid fentanyl and that there was heroin 
uh, you know, a specific brand, a bag with a specific brand, I believe it was Turbo, and that, that this particular brand included heroin and not fentanyl, and that was selling for uh, like an increased price uh, on the street. Is, that, is there any truth to that? Are, are people looking f to get away from both xylazine and fentanyl and purchase heroin? Um, you know, good question. I, I really don't think you can avoid fentanyl and xylazine if you're consuming bags of uh, dope in Philadelphia right now. Um, it seems like, you know, greater than 90% of the bags and drug trekking programs have xylazine in them, and almost all of the bags have fentanyl in them. And if they don't have fentanyl, it's either a nitazine, like a non-fentanyl uh, synthetic opioid, or a, or a different fentanyl analog. And really finding heroin in Philadelphia is like a needle in a haystack. I don't think it um, really exists in, in significant quantities. Uh, and that's not just from like talking to people, because I think people just don't know what's in the bags. Yeah. Um, but actually from drug checking programs. And, you know, we're really not seeing much heroin at all. And unfortunate, while people may want to go back to the age of heroin, brown heroin, uh, it's, it's a thing of the past. It's not coming back. You know, the monetary um, constraints or, you know, what, what is going on with the money making through fentanyl is just ne never going to allow for the natural product to ever come back again. And also from the user experience, now that we're at these doses of fentanyl that are so high, they could never go back to heroin because heroin just wouldn't ever support their dependence and they'd actually be sick despite using heroin. Isn't, isn't, that, isn't that something, that this completely uh, supply-driven phenomenon has mm -hmm. changed the nature of, of drug use and drug addiction in America? In, in a relatively That's what I hear over and over again, too. It's a supply-side market. It has nothing to do with the end user. It really has everything to do with yeah. uh, the people who are selling it. This is what I have, and this is the, where I can make the most money, and so I'm going to push this out into the streets. And, and there's, there's no, it's not your typical supply and demand market. Yeah. I mean, it just underlines the incredible vulnerability of the population that we're, we're describing. You know, and um, when I was out there in Kensington, because I was with a, a couple of people who have been working, you know, in that particular area for a number of years, they've established the trust of, of the people, like I'm sure you have. So I, I kind of benefited by that trust. And I was allowed into some abandoned buildings and I spoke with some people and I, I saw some things that, you know, frankly, I wish I hadn't seen. Um, you know, the, the wounds associated uh, with, with xylazine contamination are mind-boggling and uh, profound. And um, I wanted you to talk a little bit about that, but first I wanted to ask you a question about it because I've asked a few people this question because it's on my mind. So we know that xylazine causes uh, soft tissue wounds when you inject it. What, what about insufflation or snorting it or inhalation, otherwise smoking it? Is there any data on other routes of administration and wounds no, there really is not much at all. Actually, this is a, an area that really needs um, a lot of concentration. We need more research to understand what the cause of xylazine-associated wounds are. You know, is this a cytotoxic effect of the drug? Is it a local effect if injected into the skin? You know, I think when I first started um, understanding xylazine um, a number of years ago, I, I would have said that it, it's associated with intranasal use inhalational use and injection. Uh, but over, over the years, just talking to people more and more, it seems like that it's, it's more associated with injection drug use. Okay. And so, um, and this is also not just talking to people who are using substances, but like looking at the variation and differences or geographical differences. You know, certainly we know that on the West Coast, there's a lot more smoking of fentanyl than there is injection drug use. And talking to people who are treating um, opioid use disorder on the West Coast, they, you know, they're never seeing wounds. Um, and we sort of have this concentrated group of people in Philadelphia 
that are um, engaging with injection drug use behavior that we're seeing the wounds. And it's not just like someone who uses here and there. This is typically a person who is associated with uh, severe heavy fentanyl injection drug use. Yeah, and I had, I had uh, spoken with a few. I met one young man who had lost a foot uh, to amputation. I met a couple of other young women who had xylazine sores. And you know, interesting, and I'm, I'm happy to tell you that the, the, the two women that I talked to, I had very positive things to say about the medical care uh, that they were getting. And um, specifically, that they weren't, uh, they didn't feel like they were judged. They didn't feel like they were looked at in a punitive way. And they were, they were welcome. And uh, I really, I really, uh, it was just wonderful to hear that. So, you know, thank you for the work uh, that you're doing there. You know, there, I, just to sort of speak to that, there are some amazing groups that have their boots on the ground in Philadelphia and Kensington and specifically. Uh, Prevention Point is doing a lot of wound yeah. care. Yeah. Uh, Savage Sisters is another non-for-profit that's helping. You know, there are a lot of these programs in Philadelphia that are helping people who are living on the streets, who are engaging with injection drug use, in particular fentanyl, who have these wounds. Um, and, you know, I'm not quite sure where we'd be without them. Yeah, exactly. My, my sentiment, exactly. And, um, you know, it's the same here in Vermont. We have coaching, we have volunteers, we have 12-step programs, we have recovery centers, we have the medical profession, you know, we have harm reduction. I mean, we're all out. There's been a robust response in Vermont. We're doing everything we can. And, and it really kind of, to me, just throws light on the severity of what we're dealing with. Because even with a robust response, Still, the numbers of deaths climb each year more, each year more. Which brings me to another question from Dr. Rawson. Dr. Rawson wondered if, if he cited some, some drugs that have infiltrated in America for good, and then some that have come and gone. And he wondered, do we think that xylazine is something that is going to, you know, be here indefinitely, or will it pass on to some next thing what what do we do we have any idea about that or any way to kind of make a you know a guess about that no but i can give you some of my opinions yeah uh, i yeah. think like uh i think xylazine is here to stay i think it's only going to get worse i don't think we have seen the peak of this uh disorder this epidemic just yet um i think with a recent switch from a veterinary pharmaceutical supply to an illicit powder supply, just like fentanyl, uh, the monetary, um, you know, forces in there are just really going to just point towards it's only going to continue to increase. Well, you know, so then I'll go into this segment now. I had planned to, to go into it a little bit later, but this is really the time to do it. <clears throat> With, 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 with that in mind, a rising number of loved ones taken from us yearly. I just read some uh, data from Nora Volkov. The figure for 2021 was over 109,000 people. The figure from October 21 to October 22, which is the latest figure, was over 107,000 people. Now, all of those are not opioids, but unless I'm mistaken, more than two-thirds are. It's, up, it's around 70% are opioids. So we're looking at a, like a tsunami of death, and all our responses are inadequate. So what, what comes to mind for me, and what I've been focusing on, is really two things. One is overdose prevention centers or systems of overdose prevention centers. And then the second is safer supply. Do you have, do you have opinions on, on both those interventions? Yeah, I think, um, you know, over and over again, we focus um, politically on like prohibition, right? And uh, that just does not seem to work. And the more regulations, the more scheduling, the more border patrol uh, activity we sort of concentrate on, we just keep seeing increasing, increasing number of overdose deaths. So there's like the overdose death crisis, and I think prohibition is not going to fix the overdose death crisis. 
And what we really need is a safe supply or a safe way for people that are going to use. Um, and overdose prevention centers are like, uh, you know, are a great example of a, a, a harm reduction manner of preventing those overdose deaths. We're providing a safe supply, um, especially for people with the severe use that despite multiple attempts at treatment, have just have never been able to get into recovery. We wanna keep those people alive until, um, you know, better treatments are available to help them achieve recovery and a safe supply seems to be uh, like a step towards that. For the viewing audience that may not be familiar with that term, would you explain what safe or safer supply is? Um, I think just simply a supply that people, a supply of opioids that people can use that they know, you know, the dose, they know that it's pure, that they know that it is uh, not contaminated with um, lots of other substances. Uh, so people can meter a dose so they know what they can expect. And so they're not getting, um, you know, randomly large doses and other days really small doses. And, that, you know, the, the variability in the supply and the contaminants in the supplies what typically kills people. And so if there was a safe supply, they knew what was the dose, they knew the dose that they were getting, uh, knew what was in it, then overdose deaths would drop tremendously. You know, we have, um, I'm, I'm fairly certain you're familiar with it, we, we have On Point New York City in Harlem and Washington Heights in, in New York. Mm -hmm. And then we have two sites getting ready to open in uh, Rhode Island. Um, it seems that the sites in New York unequivocally have remarkable data coming in all the time. Hundreds and hundreds of overdoses uh, reversed. I think maybe between five and ten times they had to call emergency services. Incredibly uh, uh, high uh, cost savings to the city in terms of law enforcement, uh, sanitation, um, you know, d different types of... Um, very costly services that have to be provided. Uh, with, with data like that, do you have any kind of feeling about, you know, America's coming to a place where we can finally begin to embrace overdose prevention centers? Yeah, I think um, I just wish we were able to sort of keep this in a medical conversation and uh, take the overdose prevention sites out of a political conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and But unfortunately, there, this is like highly controversial sort of stuff, and so it gets highly politicized. But certainly from like a science research and medical treatment perspective, you know, it reduces, you know, the needles on the street. It reduces, uh, you know, open air use where people are just on the side of the on a sidewalk using and everyone is there to see it uh clearly it's, it's reducing overdose deaths uh you know all of the stuff would look like we're saving lives from a public health um standpoint and and you know and in in, in, in to, to complement that in the traditional harm reduction approach people using drugs go to overdose prevention centers and they're welcome as you know, worthy people with, with 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 dignity, you know, worthy of being paid attention to, and you know, getting to know each other. This relationship, you know, offered to them. It's a safe place, and this this particular population that we're talking about, and you know better than I do because you work with them every Wednesday. They're they're, they're probably the most unsafe population in America, besides being unhoused and unfed. They're addicted to drugs that are contaminated with poison. I don't think you can get more at risk than that. Now, this particular population also, unfortunately, tragically, has to face stigma. And one of the places that I know of where there is no stigma is in the harm reduction world. So bringing these people in and allowing them to uh, take drugs, helping them, basically teaching them to take drugs safely, it seems to be the epitome of meeting someone where they are. And that, you can't, you can't fake that. And for, for this population, and many of them have been uh, persecuted, prosecuted, stigmatized, punished, rejected, traumatized, this particular population, the harm reduction world, is probably the only place they can engage. 
and it's overdose prevention centers. And we have, we have harm reduction centers in Vermont, don't get me wrong. They're not overdose prevention centers, and they do exactly what I'm saying. They engage people. But an overdose prevention center seems to me to be the, the, the next logical step in this, in this evolution. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I just want to echo those those thoughts there, Ed. And you know, this is why I really um, I really like the term comprehensive user engagement site. Mm, mm. Uh, that was a that's somewhere along the evolution of the, the name. We've we've landed on overdose prevention sites, but really, overdose prevention sites can be so much more than just preventing an overdose. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, if you add. Uh, medical care and recovery services to a site like that, uh, you you improve the health of people who are using substances. Mm -hmm. And you know, you know, w one day where I'm not interested in recovery, I'm I, I show up there and I meet Joe and I say, you know, like, and Joe is there and nice to me and doesn't treat me in a stigmatized manner, um, and I get I create a relationship, and then. You know, in due time, when I'm ready for recovery, I now have I, I have the trust of Joe to help me get into yeah. recovery. And if it all is engaged there, people know where to go for that care. So, yeah. Yeah, and in New York, I've spoken a couple of times with the people from New York, Kaylin C. in particular. And, um, you know, they have a barber. They have washers and dryers. They have showers. You know, so people can come in, the coffee... People can come in, you know, can, can get a couple of other needs met, can feel safe. And even, even yeah. if they're just going there for that, I just want a cup of coffee and I want a haircut. Fine, you know, and, and if that's why you're coming, come and let's engage you because you may come here for other more profound mm -hmm. reasons going forward. So, yes. Like wound care, yeah. HIV care, hepatitis C care. Yeah. Yeah. Those are all really important things. Yeah. You know, so I'm, I'm just really glad we're on the same uh, uh, page. And the more we can hear people like you, you know, speaking out about this, um, the more likely we are to, to turn this corner at some point. What do you, do you have any opinion about the reluctance? There seems to be, it's, it's lessening now. There are more, we seem to be reaching like a, a little bit of a tipping point where you'll hear more and more people speaking out, you know, calling out for change, you know, um, citing the science of overdose prevention centers or, comp what did you call it, comprehensive? I like that. What was that? Comprehensive user engagement sites. Cues. Comprehensive user engagement sites. You'll hear more and more people about speaking out, but what do you, what do you think it is that keeps a, people with scientific minds people with medical minds, people with, with wealth of experience, what, what is keeping them, the, the, the majority of them silent? I don't understand it. You know, I think it's a generational thing, Ed, and I think uh, it's really amazing that someone with your experience of life uh, is on this side, but uh, you know, I think there are many people in a generation that came before me that don't really understand this, and uh, aren't ready to in, uh, accept it or engage with it. And so I, I think just like um, the using the analogy of HIV, I think is super important. Mm -hmm. You know, when uh, HIV, when we first, dis first discovered what HIV was and started treatment for HIV, I think we ran into a lot of the same sort of stigma we see here with opioid use disorder. And it took generations to get to the point where we are now. And uh, yeah, yeah. losing that stigma, supporting research, and treating it just like any other infection or, or disorder has, has been really important for getting HIV to the point today where you know, you're living with HIV, it's not a death sentence, it's been really amazing. And I think it's gonna take generations to get to the same point with opioid use disorder. Yeah, I think unfortunately you're right, and it's just the, the human way you know, as far as I'm concerned, um, you know, I, I'm in recovery myself for 38 years. I, I was an injection drug user. I was unhoused in San Francisco for seven years. Um, I entered into my own personal recovery, and my recovery, I have no doubt about it, was abstinence-based, 
100%. And I believed in abstinence-based recovery, and I still do. But what would happen to me, and I became a counselor. Uh, I had a 30-year career doing therapy with people with substance use disorder. But gradually, my mind began to open you know, to ways other than abstinence-based, namely harm reduction. And what opened my mind was the reality of death, mounting death within a population of people that couldn't just, just achieve abstinence. They were going to continue to use. And as a result of stigma driving them away from healthcare systems and addiction driving them toward drug use, they were dying left and right. How can one adhere to an abstinence-based dogma when, when, when that is reality? And I've talked to other people, other prof professionals of my generation, who have been around for a while, who had that abstinence-based kind of bias, who opened their minds. So there, there, there are many people today opening their minds. And I, I agree with you, though, you know, gener gen this is going to be a generational, a generational thing. So, you know, I, I get it. I'm in, I should retire, but this is so exciting <laughs> that I please. can't. <laughs> you know, the, 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 not to not be so pessimistic, I'm looking on the optimistic side, I engage with a lot of medical students today, and, uh, uh, and engaging with them, I have a lot of hope that the next generation gets it. Um, yeah. you know, this is going to be their burden, you know, the HIV of their generation. You know, this is the this is the biggest crisis of their of their lifetime. And uh, the the horizon looks good because I, a lot of medical students that I engage with um, understand this and are not are, the, there's a new wave of doctors coming up that are treating people in non stigmatized ways. They're learning at a very early stage in their career to meet people where they're at and be uh, patient-centered. And I think uh, I've got a lot of optimism. That's, that's uh, beautiful to hear. I know the American Society of Addiction Medicine for a long time has been kind of leading the way. I know that there are programs with um, uh, addiction psychiatrists, uh, uh, addiction, uh, the certifications in addiction. There's certainly a growing uh, field. Do you do any of that work at your um, at your university in Philadelphia at Temple? Um, I'm, I'm addiction medicine, uh, not to be confused with addiction psychiatry, which there is a huge overlap there. But uh, a lot of the work that I'm doing is through, uh, the, through ASAM, which is um, uh, the Society of Addiction Medicine. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then I, and I work at, uh, at Lewis Katz School of Medicine at Temple, and I engage with, uh, with a lot of uh, medical students who in, through an uh, addiction medicine interest group. And there's lots of interest, and there's lots of, um, you know, the next generation of, trying, of, of students trying to get involved and to uh, find a cure. Yeah. You know, recently, that you mentioned that is interesting because recently Nora Volkov had a, a blog very recently, like last week, about a cure for addiction. And it involved, um, you know, um, uh, ultrasonic uh, brain waves and different types of brain treatments that were, were really, I mean, uh, something that I had never ever thought of. So apparently there's a tremendous amount of funding going into, into, into research at this point. Yeah, there is a lot of funding, grant funding out there for addiction research, you know, and boy, we need it because the options for treatment right now are so limited. Um, and for so many people, buprenorphine and methadone just don't work for them. And we need to have alternative options for people. Um, we've talked about safe supply, but I think there are treatments out there. There's medications out there that uh, we need to work on to help treat dependence, withdrawal, and then addiction. Um, we need, we need, there needs to be a new wave of medications and treatments. Um, along, along, and I know there's research going into that, but along those lines, I know that there is a, like an antidote for xylazine overdose in, in, in animals. But that antidote or uh, overdose reversal uh, drug, 
uh, has has not. I don't think it's been tested on humans. Is there any 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 hope that in the future we might have a um, uh, an overdose reversal for xylazine that 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 humans can use? You know, there certainly is a medication that is used for reversal of xylazine in the veterinary world. Medications of tifamazole. Um, but I think probably the bigger question is, do we need a reversal agent? You know, just like we have a reversal agent for benzodiazepines, which mm -hmm. is flumazenil, it's not a medication that we use regularly. And actually there's significant harm that is associated with that drug if you're giving it to someone who has benzodiazepine dependence. Um, but the way I look at xylazine is, uh, you know, it's not causing a significant, um, it's not causing a significant number of overdose deaths. And we're certainly only seeing it with opioids, and opioids are really the major cause of overdose death. And actually, after reversing opioids, if a patient remains sedate um, from xylazine, uh, they usually do pretty well uh, with just supportive care. And so if it's you know, someone in the field uh, managing this overdose or someone coming to the emergency department, it's typically really just some supportive care of managing their airway. And even from the data from overdose overdoses that are associated with xylazine, these patients are typically discharged from the emergency department because mm -hmm. it's not this mm -hmm. prolonged sedation mm -hmm. or they don't end up in critical care, mm -hmm. uh, intensive care units. Uh, they typically, the drug wears off and they're fine. You know, when you mention that, again, what comes to my mind immediately is overdose prevention centers because uh, with, 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 with xylazine, uh, I, I believe it's called um, hypoxia. There's a blunted response to hypoxia. In other words, the person stops breathing and they don't really care. They're not even aware of it. It's not, it's not as with an opioid, the mechanism that causes you to breathe shuts down and you just stop breathing. With, with xylazine, you want to keep breathing. Something gets in the way of your breathing and you're so sedated that you don't do anything about it. So it seems that in an overdose prevention center, people in overdose prevention centers could be very quickly trained on how to position a body to keep airwaves, uh, airways open and, and perhaps save a life. Whereas people on the street with Narcan you know, may not, may not know about this. And getting the information out to them, I think it's gonna take a while, but I also think we need to get this information out to, to, to people who are using drugs, you know, on the street. You're absolutely correct. I think there's some misinformation out there, but it seems like you've been to a couple of my lectures, Ed, I have. about xylazine. Uh, xylazine does not cause respiratory depression in the sense like it, opioids do, where they slow the respiratory rate down. You know, what uh, xylazine does is very similar to what benzodiazepines or alcohol in large quantities would do. It would, the sedative, it puts you to sleep. And if your airway is occluded or you vomit and there's uh, vomit in your mouth and you can't clear your airway, you don't wake up to clear your airway yeah. like yeah. you would, uh, like with someone with a sleep apnea, you know, if they're sleeping and including their airway, catecholamines wake them up and then they, they, they breathe, they take a deep breath. Whereas with xylazine, it makes you so sleepy, you don't wake up to clear your airway to take a deep breath. Yeah, you know, so, <clears throat> I mean, getting all this information out, and that's part of what this interview will do. This information will, will get out, people will share this widely, and, yeah. and your, you know, information that's potentially life-saving, you know, will, will, will be disseminated. So that's the purpose of the Addiction Recovery Channel, and I know from your, you know, generosity with your time, that, that it's your purpose too, you know, to get this word out there, to help people to really understand what, what we can do about this because we're, we're in this together. Um, I, wanna, I, wanna, I wanna thank you, you know, I wanna offer you with this, uh, you know, a, a deep, a deep sense of gratitude for your time today, doctor. Um, do you have any, any, uh, anything else you'd like to add today? <clears throat> Um, you know, I think we sort of, uh, you know, with, the, with some new information out that uh, from ONDCP that xylazine, uh, they're working towards uh, scheduling xylazine and, you know, they've announced that it is the, the combination of xylazine and fentanyl is an emerging drug threat. 
think it's going to be super helpful in spurring on some research to make sure everyone's aware that this is a dangerous uh, drug um, and that we need to understand a lot more about it. Um, but I, you know, my concerns are the, you know, the, the criminal ramifications of scheduling this drug and just compounding all the problems of, um, you know, drug possession charges out there for people yeah. who are, who have, a, who have a substance use disorder. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I'm concerned that it's not going to curtail the drug supply. And while that may be what people are intending to do, I think as we move to powder supply for xylazine, it's not going to make much of an effect. And really, it's only going to negatively impact people who are using drugs. Yeah, I, I uh, sadly agree with you. I think that uh, Dr. Gupta at the uh, RX summit made this announcement. And he also, uh, from what I've heard, implied that resources would become available. But the definition of resources and the definition of resources for what well, was left uh, a little foggy. So we don't, we don't know, no one really knows right now. But yeah, criminalization, as we've seen since the inception of the war on drugs, does exactly the opposite of anything anyone would want to accomplish. You know, and I, I agree with you on that. So thank you. And, you know, I, I love your uh, enthusiasm, you know, about the, the medical profession and the way the medical profession is moving forward. I love your enthusiasm about, like, committing to this. Even if it takes generations, we're not, we're not going to give up. We're not going away. We're not going to stop. We're not going to stop loving people. We're not going to stop being here for people who need us. So thank you. Thanks for having me, Ed. Yeah. To my, to my audience, um, there's going to be a screen lingering now with 211. 211 is the helpline in Vermont. If you call 211 and hit prompt 5, you'll get in touch with a real person who will give you information on uh, harm reduction services, uh, treatment services, uh, recovery center services, a, a, a wide, very wide range of services. And I want everyone to know that I would never, ever recommend something I hadn't tried. And I called them today. I called 211 today. And I, 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 I was put in touch with a person, and I asked all the questions I wanted to ask about harm reduction, about um, um, a syringe supply, about wound kits, about fentanyl test strips. And I was treated with the utmost respect, the utmost dignity. I didn't even feel a whiff of stigma coming toward me. So this is a safe number for you to call, 211. If you need help, immediately call 211 and hit prompt number five, and you will be directed toward, toward a resource. So again, thank you, doctor, and, and thank you, my viewing audience. See you next time.